Thank you, Iris, and um, thank you to Rory and Tommy for organizing, and it's really great to be here, and thank you all for, for coming. This is a great opportunity to synthesize a lot of different things that I've been working on. Um, um, Iris didn't mention explicitly, but I'm here at the geography department um, for a sabbatical this year, um, hosted by Anna Davies. Thank you, Anna. And it's just been a pleasure to be here. And there's so many innovative things happening um, in Ireland. Um, and getting out of the United States for a year is great to get some perspective. <laughs> and um, so thank you all for being here. What I want to do today is actually be a bit provocative and propose a paradigm shift for how we think about universities. Um, I, I want to make the case that universities are not really helping leveraged to the degree they could for transformative societal change that's needed. And I don't have the answers in terms of how to uh, necessarily change that, but I, I want to make kind of open up a conversation and try to get everybody to kind of think differently about what we could be doing in, in our higher education system. So um, what, what climate justice lens really asks us to be kind of critical of our own role um, in either reinforcing or um, resisting kind of problematic power structures. And, um, and some of this is uncomfortable because this isn't what we're like regularly thinking about. And I think we need, if we want things to change, we actually need to get uncomfortable. Um, and I, I mo know kind of a paradox of higher education organizations is they're institutions designed to teach and places of learning, but they themselves um, are quite stuck in old traditions and not necessarily adapting and learning to what society needs. So that's kind of the premise. Um, and I want to just mention that I bring a feminist, uh, anti-racist uh, lens to this work. Um, and uh, you know, I wrote a book in 2020 called Diversifying Power, why we need anti-racist feminist leadership on climate and energy. Climate and energy is kind of my space that I've done the most work, but I really think that we need anti-racist feminist leadership across the board and particularly in higher education. Um, and I'll talk more about what I mean by that. Um, but basically it's paying attention to power dynamics and structures and systemic uh, uh, policies, practices, and priorities that perpetuate kind of the concentration of wealth and power and some people being advantaged while others are disadvantaged. So I wanna begin by just saying climate change is not the problem. Climate change is a symptom of a deeper problem. Um, and um, uh, that's really an economic system that has been built to extract uh, from people and the planet. And Obviously, there's lots of other symptoms, lots of other problems in the world, uh, biodiversity loss, mental health, substance abuse, gun violence, so many problems, and they're all kind of linked, um, I propose, and many others have also proposed, it, it, to our systems that are uh, basically privileging corporate interests over the public good. And I think we're in a time of polycrisis. I mean, that word has been used recently. So it's not just the climate crisis, right? There's all kinds, there's a housing crisis, there's economic crisis, there's um, all kinds of challenges that we're facing. And I also wanna acknowledge um, kind of the, that this is actually deep suffering and violence. Uh, slow violence is the, the, the phrase, you know, we, we, we look at the horror of the devastation and, and death in Syria um, and Turkey right now, over 40,000 people, uh, you know, and death toll keeps going up. That was so acute, but similar or worse devastation and suffering and deaths are happening all the time with climate, ch with climate impacts and climate disruptions around the world. And it's hard to, you know, so I just wanna acknowledge that this is like real horrible suffering happening all over that it's just it's that we that needs to be addressed um, but it's because it's so kind of slow and gradual in some sense it's slow and gradual other ways it's actually quite rapid um, we don't have this necessarily the same urgency or or um, shock uh, about it and really 
one of the real crux of the problem, I think, is this concentration of wealth and power. What's happening is, um, you know, people and corporate interests and um, who already have a lot of, of wealth are, have been using that wealth to influence our policy, influence what's happening, influence how we're responding to the climate crisis, resisting change, and um, it's, it's really, and, we're go and we don't see any break to that, right? It's actually getting worse every year. The fossil fuel companies in 2022 um, made more profits than they've ever made, while most people are struggling to pay their energy bills. Like, why is that okay, right? Um, um, so we have these interconnected, wicked problems, grand challenges. Those are sometimes the words that university presidents <laughs> and others say, like, this is what the university should be doing. We should be addressing these big, grand challenges. Yet, I think, I, I suggest we're, we're not really to the degree that we could um, yet. So I think we're kind of an unleveraged resource, um, and I think there's a lot more we could be doing. So. Um, one of the things that has happened with the climate crisis is a deep focus on technological innovation. And I think universities and scientists play a role in that. Um, and I've written about a, a term called climate isolationism, which is this kind of narrow way of thinking about the climate crisis as technocratic. It's based on masculine colonial ideas of domination and control. And it's, it has a very technological optimistic, like, oh, we'll figure out a technology to fix that, you know? Um, and it, but th by, doing, by focusing on technology, it actually perpetuates extractive economies, and it misses opportunities to invest in people and communities and what um, I think we, we really need. Um, so I propose, instead of focusing with the climate isolationist lens, we need to shift the mindset when we think about climate and focus on social justice, economic justice, and this brings us to this word of climate justice. And it's really about investing in people and communities, basing those investments on human dignity and basic needs, a people's first approach, distributing power, literally and figuratively, and leveraging the urgency of the climate crisis for that larger um, transformation. So, I think it's really important, and this is what I suggest everyone try to do in your, in your teaching, your work, have a transformative lens. Like we have to get move beyond small incremental steps. Um, we actually need structural systemic change. Um, nobody knows how to do that. It's hard to research, but we need to be teaching and like framing the problems within that kind of perspective. And, and this is where you can bring in feminist, decolonial, anti-racist principles, which basically just focus on power dynamics and the, and the structures and systems that are uh, perpetuating the privilege of some with the um, marginalization of others. So we have an opportunity to you know, honor people and the planet and resist extractive power dynamics. And I think we have a huge need for more research, learning, and practice that focuses on like resisting the kind of mainstream. And I guess this is where um, we can talk about this in the Q&A, but you know, I, I suggest that we either choose to resist some of the problematic power dynamics or we're reinforcing them, right? And you obviously, we're all part of these systems, we're, so we're constantly um, kind of deciding, do we resist or do we reinforce? Um, but I think you can't really be neutral um, and we're all reinforcing all the time. I'm not saying we have to resist everything, right? We're in part of these systems, but I think we have to be more um, intentional about considering when we can try to disrupt and change the systems that we're in. So I, I wanna give a brief introduction to who I am, just so you understand where I'm coming from. I actually am a dual Irish uh, American citizen. I was born in Dublin here, um, and our family moved to Boston when I was eight. Um, I knew I wanted to study environment, and I studied first environmental science and policy, then environmental science and engineering, much more technical perspective, focused on water and aquatic chemistry. Um, but then I knew I wanted to get back into policy, so I did a postdoc um, on energy technology policy. I was a faculty member at Clark University for nine years, 
um, then at the University of Vermont for two years, and then I've been at Northeastern for the past six and a half years, and um, I'm here in Dublin for my sabbatical this year. Um, and just to give you an overview kind of, of where, how I come to, to, come to all this. Um, so now I want to get into the discussion more explicitly about universities. And um, a, a PhD student and I wrote a piece in the Boston Globe in September saying higher education needs a new mission. How about climate justice? So we're proposing um, that we can use the climate justice frame to justify and reimagine what universities are doing and why we're, what, you know, how we prioritize and um, for a more transformative uh, perspectives and um, disrupt some of the systems that we're um, contributing to. So I want to first take a minute to just distinguish between climate justice and mainstream climate action. So most of us are all familiar about climate action. Um, and this is what most of many university initiatives are focused on as well, focusing on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, decarbonizing the energy system, decarbonizing the economy. The focus tends to be on technology change or changing behavior and making long-term goals, but they're off, a lot of the big long-term goals are based on assumptions of technologies that we're not sure whether, you know, how they're going to work and, and all of that. So, it's very techy and quantitative, and um, that's kind of what mainstream climate action is. What we're talking about, and what I want to encourage all of us to be thinking about, is climate justice, which is much bigger. It's much broader, it's, and it's much beyond the narrow technocratic way of thinking about greenhouse gas emissions and decarbonization. It's about reducing human vulnerabilities, marginalization of people, exploitation of people, oppression, by enhancing equity and justice. So it's really about focusing on people and communities and households who are um, struggling the most. And by doing that, we will also be able to, in fact, it's the only way many people are arguing that we'll be able to get the change that we need for even to be successful with the decarbonization. Because until everybody's included, um, and we have a more um, robust kind of social justice base, it, the efforts for decarbonization are not going to, they're going to continue to be ineffective, right, how, how they have been over the past few decades. So this approach of climate justice um, is about investing in people and communities, understanding and resisting structures, policies, practices, relationships that maintain injustice. Um, and it really has a more of a mindset of solidarity and collective action. Um, and it's very much based on intersectional and international feminist scholarship. Um, and the, the framing, no climate justice without gender justice, is an uh, important uh, lens in the climate justice activism space. And um, the whole idea of climate justice is, is that it will broaden and reframe the mainstream discourse and make it more impactful and also hold people accountable in different ways. So um, that's the kind of introduction to what we're talking about when we talk about climate justice. Um, so then if you think about universities, what do universities do? And how do we at universities engage with societal transformation? Obviously, the main thing we do is teach students uh, our educational learning. Um, we also do a lot of research, um, and we also are, you know, anchor organizations in the communities that we're in, and we have a lot of opportunities for um, contributing to community, all kinds of external initiatives. And then we have the campus itself, right, which some, t some campuses are like small cities, right, like they're, they're a whole community or entity in and of itself. So there are there's full spectrum of things to think about if we think about how universities could be more transformative with maybe a climate justice lens. Um, and just actually last week, um, we got a paper published um, with kind of a review of some of the different ways that we think climate justice can be a framework 
a paradigm shift in higher education to move universities, colleges and universities toward a more transformative role. And this paper um, I worked on with a team of students. These are six of, of my students, both undergraduates and graduate students. And we worked on it for two years and it finally got published. Um, and if you're interested in more details, um, you can uh, check out that, that paper. It is open access. Um, so what I want to do is just kind of run through um, a few of the areas. Um, and again, as I said, I don't have all the answers of what specifically um, you know, needs, needs to be done differently, uh, but I, I, I just really want to be kind of provocative and, and think through some of the, some of the, area, the possibilities and potential here. So um, first of all, I think we need to acknowledge and resist the non-transformative policies, practices, priorities that reinforce the status quo. A lot of things that go on in universities <laughs> reinforce the status quo um, because we have financial incentives, we have political incentives, we have elitism, we're very exclusive, only certain people get to be part of the university. Um, we, ha we have a very much a focus on individual success. Uh, rather than collective goals, it, you know, there's a competitive environment. We're supposed to be who's best and who's best in the class, and you know, and it doesn't. It it, it focuses on individuals rather than like a collective good. And then we have disciplinary silos, right? So that separate us. So we have to focus narrowly. Many of us, it, you know, you're in the. That's what's so great about geography is that it's so encompassing and broad. Um, but you know, if you're in an economics department or if you're in a, a, even in an engineering department, you're quite narrowly uh, focused. So that limits some of w how you can think transfor transformatively. So other, other characteristics um, that are why I, proposing that universities are actually perpetuating the status quo and reinforcing injustice, um, you know, the disciplinary silos I just mentioned, um, how we train, conventional training, promotional process, peer review, it's very much a gatekeeper model. So the people who are already there decide who else gets to come in and who's successful. So like it tends to mean that the experienced people who've already made it then decide what, who's successful. So it, it tends to um, you know, reinforce the same rather than have more um, innovative uh, approaches, then there's often a narrow technocratic way of thinking. Focus is, there is a big focus, and a lot of the, this is funding driven, for more technological innovation. We've invested so much more in engineering and science than we have in social science and humanities. Um, and, and that means we're not really leveraging the opportunities for social change and social innovation um, the way that we could. Um, we're often serving privileged elites um, who are less interested in change, literally, because they think the world is fine, right? They're doing very well. And um, often we're catering to corporate interests who are donating money. Um, and there's been a decline in public funding kind of across the board. Um, so we're more reliant on private sector and philanthropy. Um, and you know, there's, there's a whole emerging field of critical university studies that is pointing out how universities are actually, you know, perpetuating um, um, kind of corporate interests, and and financialization is is a big piece of that. So I just want to take a minute to mention um, financialization in higher ed. Generally, we think about universities as focused on education, learning, and knowledge creation, which of course we are. Um, but we don't necessarily always think about universities as focused on growth and expansion, accumulating resources and wealth, minimizing employee benefits, expanding real estate and buildings, and concentrating power among those who are already privileged. So there's a whole network and system of kind of capitalizing on the knowledge sector, and higher ed is a big part of that. And, um, you know, and then there's obviously competition among uni universities and, and some are doing really well and others are really um, not doing so well. And I know the United States context is different than here in Europe, but um, some, many of the same trends are, are here as well. 
So um, there's been quite a bit of critique, particularly there's this book in the shadow of the ivory tower, how universities are plundering our cities. And this is happening in the United States in particular, a lot of universities in the urban context are expanding and um, moving, displacing all kinds of people in communities. Um, and it's really kind of this corporatization, the university as a business and the university then is profiting from parking, food services, the sports, and, they, and the focus on tech is linked to entrepreneurs and tech startups and can we get some IP and how are we gonna, can we get some money out of the research? Um, and a lot of, in that context, a lot of sustainability efforts in higher ed have been really critiqued as completely kind of insufficient and they're, they're just greenwashing and techno solutionism. Universities say they're helping, you know, contribute, but they may not really be. And, um, and so, so there's a whole critique, critique there. Um, so that's, that's one area. I then want to talk a little bit about what we're actually teaching in universities, the curriculum. Um, we could be teaching about the solidarity economy and reciprocity and reclaiming and restructuring learning so that people are, have, are empowered for collective action. Uh, but oftentimes we're not. We're teaching students so that they get good jobs. Um, and sometimes that's quite selfish. And, and, um, and we're, we're also uh, limited in particularly in how we teach economics um, and business. And, um, and there's, a, there's a lot of changing we could do in the curriculum. So I just want to give one, a few quick examples in my own research teaching. Um, I teach about energy systems and energy system change. And this is a course map of what, what we teach. And the top is technological change and the bottom is social innovation. Um, and most people who teach about energy would focus on the technologies because we think about energy as technologies. Um, but what I do in my class is focus much more on the social innovation and the, the opportunities for as we move away from fossil fuels toward a renewable based future, what kind of social change is possible? And what are the social dynamics that are actually resisting that, those changes? Um, another thing is economics. So the mainstream eco economics, and I don't know if there are economists in the audience, um, but mainstream economics literally is out of touch with reality, I would say. <laughs> um, uh, because mainstream economics assumes there's no planetary boundaries, continual perpetual growth. And like we know that is physically impossible, right? So um, there's a, a different uh, alternative we could and should be teaching in our, ec our in universities, um, which is um, kind of an economics within planetary boundaries. And, and Kate Ryworth um, has come up with this approach of donut economics, which is about pointing out the safe space for humanity um, and how we need to be kind of focusing on how to live within the safe space, right? So that we don't have all of these uh, expansive suffering and throughout the world. Um, and this is the, the model of what we could be focusing on. And you can see the environmental uh, destruction, climate change, ocean acidification, uh, nitrogen, freshwater, land, biodiversity, air pollution on the outside on this figure shows where we are. The red are places, all the places we've already overshoot. We're already in crisis, right, with regards to climate, biodiversity loss, land, um, and nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, so we need, like, you know, and people talk about tipping points, like, these, this is really, really bad. <laughs> and, um, but we're not, most students aren't necessarily getting this in their education. Um, and mainstream economics really doesn't teach this. They assume like the, the environment is just there to be used and extracted and we don't need to worry about the um, impacts. So I will also just acknowledge Claire Kelly is a, fact, a staff member here um, who just last week published an amazing paper that takes that um, donut economics um, framework to talk about academic donut. Um, and she and her co-author um, wrote about rethinking academia in a time of climate crisis. And 
they point out that we need a safe and just space within academia and that where many of us, the academic assumptions are being, we're being pushed in all kinds of, and pulled in directions that are totally unsustainable personally, professionally, and ecologically. And they propose instead of thinking about the university as a business, we could think of the university as like um, this academic donut in terms of what's, what, where we should be in a safe space, and then how, how to sh shift. Um, and the big areas are get savvy with systems, like focus on sy systems and understanding systems, um, see the big picture so can better contextualize what, who we are and what we're, our impact is in the world, um, create to regenerate um, rather than extract, and nurture um, human nature, um, so like team science and more collaborative and um, thinking about distribution and then resisting or, or they use the term being agnostic to growth. This growth paradigm that you know, is part of universities. All the universities want to grow too, right? We want more students and we're measured on our success of having more students and more majors and uh, more of everything. Um, and it's like at some point it gets to be um, uh, you know, where, where does it end? Where does that pressure end? So that's about the curriculum. I now want to talk a little bit about research. Um, and one of the main things, I guess, with research, I would say, is focusing on power, understanding power dynamics. Not every research area, um, you know, fits necessarily with that, but I think we have to think about our research priorities within kind of the planetary limits and beyond grow, thinking beyond the traditional growth and technical fix mindset and, and really thinking more about um, these systems thinking and how um, um, power dynamics are, are developing. So just a few examples. So this is research um, um, on climate obstructionism. So one of the things that I just wanted to back up a little and just say, for the reason, one of the reasons that we are not where we need to be with the climate crisis is because of decades of strategic investment to resist action on climate or climate justice, right? So I think that, that is very widely now researched and published on and accepted. Like that, 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 that is one of the reasons that we're in the place where we are. Um, what's happened instead of, you know, in the 90s, um, and even 2000s, there was a lot of climate denial saying, oh, climate change isn't a problem. We don't need to worry about it. But now most the, the pervasive language is, yes, climate change is happening. It's a problem. Um, but and we're trying to do something, but, you know, we can't do that much like we and these are the discourses of climate delay. And there are four discourses. One is uh, surrender. Say it's too hard. We can't do anything. It's too impossible. Uh, we just need to suck it up and adapt. Another is emphasizing all the downsides. Oh, well, we can't change things because this or this or this, right? Um, um, another is pushing non-transformative solutions. So pu pushing specific techno technology fixes or making goals without you know, achieving them and, um, and, and kind of perpetuating that, oh, we can still use fossil fuels uh, but we can like add on this carbon capture and storage and then it will make it okay, that kind of thing. Um, and the fourth one, the one on the top, is redirect responsibility. And I think this is where universities um, do a lot of this in, sor in sort of saying someone else needs to take the action first. Like, well, we can't do it. Like, we're, we're stuck where we are because of this, this, and this. We can't do anything differently. And that's what, I mean, you know, most, m many of us personally, institutionally, are in that space because there isn't that much we can do, but someone else needs to change things so that we can change. Um, so I, I guess I would say that it, one way to think about like research that would change um, some of these discourses of delay or uh, um, challenge them. Um, I will mention I'm working on a project. I'm part of the Climate Social Science Network, which is a network of actually a funded network. I'm not sure exactly where the money comes from, but it's out of Brown University in Rhode Island. They, I think a big, do, a big an alumni gave them this money to actually study climate obstruction, 
denial, climate denial, climate delay, climate distraction, and how it's evolving over time. We, um, with, a, with collaborators Orla Kelly at UCD and Brenda McNally at DCU, we um, got the charged with and got a small grant to um, write a paper on a review of climate obstruction here in Ireland. Um, and it's, it's an interesting nuanced uh, picture because Ireland is both a leader in terms of being some of the first to have kind of a divestment uh, policy and some other good ambitious climate policies, but actually really bad at implementing the goals, right? Implementation is a problem. Um, and, you know, in that sense, it's kind of a unique case of delay and obstruction because Ireland has such an economy first approach, relying on foreign direct investment and a lot of US capital from corporate um, co companies from the US and, and others. Um, and then it also has traditional agriculture that has, has really been leveraged um, potentially, we can, people may have different views on this, uh, to kind of resist. Um, bigger change, um, and then there's lots of positivity, like yes, we can do it, we're gonna have goals, we're gonna do this, but it's not really matched with the structural changes to make things happen. Um, and obviously transportation here in Ireland is a big issue because as a um, islanded nation, you know, we all, everyone here needs to travel other places and we have to get goods from other places, so there's some, there's some unique things um, about Ireland in, in thinking about climate obstruction. Compared to the United States, it is not as divisive um, and um, there isn't as much entrenched uh, kind of real deep obstruction. But, I, but uh, we're, I think we're learning, and others may know more, that there's actually a lot of fund, funding coming from the United States to uh, instill more of the, some of the similar kinds of tactics and strategies of climate obstruction in the United States here, here in Ireland. So um, another area of research that we could, and these are just some examples of, of things that I've worked on or I'm working on um, of the kind of research for, that has a more transformative lens, but obviously there's lots, lots more. We're working on, again with the Climate Social Science Network, I'm working on a collaborative paper on fossil fuel industry influence in academia. And this, um, a lot of fossil fuel um, interests have been donating to universities um, and uh, really influencing the research trajectory um, and not necessarily in, as you can imagine, in a way that uh, is advancing transformation away from fossil fuel reliance. Um, during my sabbatical year, um, there are a couple other great projects that I've been involved in with colleagues here at Trinity, um, with Anna and Louise. Um, um, we're working on a project on uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion in the Irish energy sector. Um, with Martin Sokol, I'm working on a project on financial innovation for climate justice. Um, he has interests and expertise in central banks, so kind of thinking about how central banks in particular and other financial um, actors are involved or could get involved in climate justice. Um, and I've been part of the group um, an uh, interdisciplinary group of Trinity staff um, led, well, not led by Jane, but Jane's part of it, Jane Stout, um, and Claire Kelly and other colleagues, I think some who might be here or online, um, you know, really challenging what it is we're doing and how we can do things differently within the systems and structures that, that we have in, in the university. So I also want to propose that not all climate research should be done, and this is, again, provocative and controversial. Um, I've been among a group of social scientists who have been arguing not to do research on solar geoengineering. Solar geoengineering is an approach saying climate change is getting so bad, why don't we could inject sulfate aerosols into the atmosphere to cool the earth? Um, and Harvard is one of the leaders in this, and um, I was actually just at a conference on solar geoengineering at Harvard a couple weeks ago, and there's a, a growing 
I think majority of people actually, they, they often, the ad, there's, there's some strong advocates of doing more research on this. And um, it's mostly uh, privileged men from global north elite universities. And they're funded by uh, tech and finance billionaires. And they want to fix the climate problem. And they're thinking of this very climate isolationist, techie approach, which I think is very dangerous. Um, because it gives one more mechanism by which one person or one country or one company could manipulate the whole Earth system. Um, so anyway, I've been part of a group um, writing about the risks of solar geoengineering research, the injustices of solar geoengineering research, and the dangers of solar geoengineering research. and. Um, the U.S. government uh, just had a National Academies report recommending the U.S. government uh, fund a whole new solar, geoengineer ge solar geoengineering research uh, program. And we wrote about that saying that's dangerous, particularly because the U.S. Is at, would be acting unilaterally and advancing this. And the United States is the wrong country to, <laughs> no country should act unilaterally on this, but particularly the United States. So um, anyway, so I think there's a role also to call out and be critical of research on climate research that could actually be dangerous. Um, and this is an example of, of that. Because of the um, solar geoengineering work, um, I was asked to contribute a chapter to Greta Thunberg's climate book. Um, I, I'm part, the chapter on solar geoengineering, surprise, surprise, and it's just a very short chapter, it's only a couple pages, um, but I've been engaged in uh, other debates, this is Doha debates on Twitter, um, about these questions of solar geoengineering. Solar geoengineering is a topic that I wish that I wasn't spending time on, um, and I wasn't doing research on, and I'm actually not really doing research on it, it's more like a anti research, but that's also controversial because some people are saying why you, ha you shouldn't be constraining anybody's research. Well, you know, academia is supposed to be free to study whatever, um, and maybe we'll need it if things get bad enough. That's the argument for solar geoengineering research. Um, I will also point out um, there is not a whole lot of research on fossil fuel phase out. Um, the real, one of the reasons we have not met the climate goals that we have um, is because the fossil fuel companies and the, the countries also that are producing fossil fuels have no plans to stop. Um, we can, you know, we can change what we do, we can change the demand, but even if Ireland or any city or country reduces all its fossil fuels, somewhere in the world there will be demand for fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are very versatile, they're very, um, you know, useful to, so, until and unless we constrain the supply of fossil fuels, I think we'll never meet any of the climate goals. And there's a growing appreciation of that. Um, so it's, n it's not about individual, I mean, part of it, obviously, we have to reduce our demand, yes. But our demand for fossil fuels um, is based on the supply. If the supply is cheap, we're gonna, it's gonna be hard to constrain it, right? And so, we, and so I think, and because of the fossil fuel interest having such powerful influence over what we study at universities, how the international climate negotiations go, people are not doing research on fossil fuel phase out very, very much. And so I proposed at Northeastern a whole research program for fossil fuel phase out, synthesize and analyze fossil fuel data, develop transformative pathways at different scales, organizations, cities and towns, governments, international agencies. We could be tracking policies, subsidies and investments. Um, and um, this is an internal proposal and they haven't taken me up on it yet. <laughs> so, you know, it, we have a, you know, it, we have interest in fossil fuels in, in my university. So um, I, it may not be taken up. Uh, but I'm still interested in doing this work, and I think there's a lot of space for people to do this work. So um, another area for, that we can change the way we do things is partnerships beyond the campus. Right now, in my university, in many universities, partnerships are all about industry, because it's about money, right? We, let's partner with this company or that, and they can provide a lot of funds, which are really useful, because universities need more funds, because the public funding has gone down. Um, but I think there's a lot of potential to um, partner with public sector, partner with community-based 
organizations, partner with ag advocacy organizations, and, and try to reduce the industry and corporate influence. Um, one example is the, so there's a growing fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty network, which is people around the world, who, individuals, you can actually sign up as an individual in favor of this, as an organization, um, and it's calling for this global coordinated effort to stop the supply of fossil fuels. Um, and um, that's, um, I'm, I'm exploring with some other colleagues, like, you know, opportunities to partner with this organization to help uh, do different kinds of research in, in universities. Um, funding the transformative universities. This is my last, last point here, um, and we can open it up to, to some questions. Um, but, and this is the, the, you know, the bottom line, right? It all comes down to the bottom line. And I don't have an answer here other than say, we need to increase public funding of universities and we need to disrupt the current financial assumptions about funding, break the, the cycle of universities being beholden to wealthy students, alumni, donors, and corporate interests, um, and or as part of that, leverage those interests for this transformative lens. Um, um, rather than to keep resisting the tran transformative lens. So um, in conclusion, I guess, um, I will say that there's a huge potential for higher education to play a role in societal transformation. I think part of the things, some of the things we need to do are kind of resist this corporatization of universities, reclaim universities as points of systems change and social justice, um, expand how we teach about collective action and having agency in society and changing things, um, advance the public good uh, rather than individual focus, individual gain, and restructure universities as critical places to question, expose, envision, um, invest more in social innovation, and really work on how to change society, right? Like plan and prepare for change uh, rather than just thinking, assuming it's like going to come or that it's all about technology. So there's growing networks of um, people in higher ed who are thinking about transformative uh, approaches. And so if you're interested, you can, there's lots of resources and people to get involved with and collaborate with. Um, and I guess we'll just end also by acknowledging like there is a feminist resistance piece of, of my, my approach and I think, um, you know, we need, there, there's a book, We Should All Be Feminists, thinking about feminism as not, as, you know, we don't just want women to be feminists, um, we want all genders uh, to think of themselves as feminists in terms of um, all people um, and deserve and the respect and also the structures, we need to work toward transformative structures so that we can uh, leverage contributions toward our collective power for transformation. So um, I guess I would consider myself a scholar activist. I know that also could be controversial. Not everybody um, is comfortable with that. Um, but I think we all have opportunities to advocate for system change, resist fossil fuel and other corporate interests, um, engage with and contribute to social and economic innovation. Um, and support innovative economic systems um, like cooperatives and other novel economic um, structures. So there, many people apparently have said this quote, you, changing university is like moving a graveyard. You don't get much help from the people on the inside. Um, but I propose that like some of us can try. Um, I, I know it's flat easy, there's a lot of um, you know, structure there, uh, but I think there's, there's, there's a lot of potential as well. And I also, I like this uh, figure to just photograph to show that when the landscape changes, but you still play by the old rules, like the game doesn't work, right? Like if you tried to play uh, football on that, it, you know, it doesn't work. So I propose that some of the things we're doing in higher education are not really working to the way we want them to. Um, and we have a lot of potential to do, change what we're doing. So I'd like to thank many colleagues, collaborators, and, and students, and particularly here at um, Trinity, Anna, my host, and, and Iris, um, the 
chair of, is chair of the word, of geography department, yeah. And uh, thank you to Rory and Tommy too for all the organization. So I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. I, well, just on, the, on the, the point that you mentioned there about identifying yourself as a scholar and activist, one of the, the difficulties that I always find is that if you if you're, see yourself as a scholar or within the academic community, there's a sort of sense that the trust in what we say is based on you know a kind of truth that is beyond politics in a way. So if you then go and turn that into a sort of activism that speaks to those who are politically sensitive or listen, do you have you ever personally encountered that that has sort of undermined the trust that maybe you hold as an academic yeah. with those communities or those those groups of people? Yeah, so the question was about scholar activism and does it undermine kind of the legitimacy of being a scholar. And I would say that there's no such thing as being politically um, neutral, right? Where all, everything, all, if you do choose not to engage in politics, that's a political choice, right? So um, I think you, we're, we're all, I mean, we all have our own choice of how to navigate that. And there's the traditional mindset that says the science is apolitical, and you can continue to you know believe that if you want, but it's not. The funding we know the funding is political. What projects are funded? Where the research originates from? Like who wants this research done? Like our research is not um, you know outside the political. So. Um, I think that would be my, my response to that. But I, I, I know the, the question, and I'm familiar with it, and I think a lot of people feel that. But I guess I would say, and, and also in the, the world that we're living in, like how can you not want to engage, right, to contribute to what's happening? Like you can't really. Like, and so that's why I would argue that there is, there is not really a neutrality or an un, unbiased perspective. We're all part of it, yeah. And then, so, come to you there, Susan, first, and then. Yeah, so first of all, thanks so much for a really inspiring lecture. I uh, really, really enjoyed uh, listening to this evening and the conversation that we've had. And I suppose that quite, I, I very much agree with an awful lot of what you've said in terms of the current incentive structures within universities. Um, I'm really admiring the fact that you managed to get through the entire conversation without once mentioning the SDGs, capitalism, or neoliberalism. Congratulations. Thank <laughs> 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 you as I was listening to you. But I thought my question is really, around, it's a little bit more practical, right? So one of the things that I think we do need to recognize is, well, I suppose two things we need to recognize. One, the disciplinary training that we all receive, you know, the theoretical underpinnings of that come in at different stages of degrees. We all have quite different worldviews. Mm -hmm. And unpacking those worldviews as academics working in interdisciplinary spaces can be really uncomfortable. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how we can get a little bit more comfortable with those types of conversations. Mm -hmm. You know, some disciplines are much more focused on solutions, others are much more focused on really kind of trying to unpack some of the critical underpinnings and some of the injustices in spaces and we propose solutions. And bringing those together is not easy. Mm -hmm. um, so I suppose, how do we do that more effectively? Within the system that we currently have, that's really difficult to do because we are incentivized towards complete disciplinary, narrow disciplinary excellence at all times. So it's a really tricky ask um, of the academic community. And I just, I, I feel, I'm not sure we have the tools necessarily to do that. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. And the last comment on that is, you know, this is a very messy and uncertain space. Some academics are very comfortable with the idea of messiness and uncertainty. Many are not. And indeed, many disciplines, their purpose is to bring order to that chaos. Mm -hmm. So I think, I just wonder if you could talk a little bit more about what we might do practically to try and open up this space and get comfortable with our discomfort. Yeah. So um, I think, I mean, there's all kinds of opportunities to incentivize transdisciplinarity, right? And, and funding is one of them, like support people to go work and collaborate with people in the other unit, right, like that are outside the, the realm. And I, I'm sure like those kinds of things are, are thought about. So you're talking also like deeper than that. Um, I think, I guess, um, you know, I'm in some ways myself, I, I, I say sometimes I don't have a discipline because I'm so interdisciplinary and I've been trained in a lot of different areas. So I don't 
relate to that as much because I my own experience isn't as much narrow. Like I have actually traversed these different spaces and, and I find that people are actually really excited about engaging um, if if they can, right? If it makes sense, if if it helps them advance and, and, and I think students, I mean it's just natural to um, connect to the dots, right? Um, so I think so some of that, I, I actually, you know, I, I know the traditional promotion and, and even sequence of how we teach and everything does still funnel people towards a, a, a specific discipline. But I think that's being bro broken down in lots of different ways, and I think it will continue to, to be broken down. Um, your other question was, just remind me this I about the... Just the last piece was, you know, how do you get to be comfortable with messiness? And oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, not everybody will be, but, you know, it could be that once we change things, we'll attract different people to academia, right? And then it might be easier to do some of this. So the people who are here now might not be comfortable with it, but um, younger generations of people might be more comfortable with it. And I think that's what a lot of the transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary programs, including both undergraduate and graduate programs, are training people to be more comfortable with it. So, um, and also when you, in the world that we're in, externally looking out, like you see how everything's connected, right? Uh, people are seeing how everything's connected. So um, I think there's, there's some, you know, gravity toward that and, and more comfort with it. But yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so first of all, thank you so much, Annie. It was really interesting. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I was very much intrigued um, by your piece on solar fuel engineering, and I have a few questions about that because it's obvious that you you think that some of the effects are very harmful. I was wondering if you could tell a bit more about that because, um, well, first of all, I don't know anything about solar fuel engineering. It's actually the first time I heard about it, and I really do agree with you that you know there really has to be system change and climate justice has to be first of all. But I also think we can agree that. The, the system change that we're looking for isn't happening at the moment mm -hmm. because the structures that, that, that are perpetuating inequalities are so resistant to change. So I think I and many people with me worry a lot that if we only focus on that system change, we're not able to reach the, the, the climate goals within time and therefore don't you think we should also stay open to those technological solutions as well because if we don't, um, and we don't reach the system change on, on time, and maybe even like more climate injustices. Yeah. So great question, and I think yes to some technological approaches. I'm not saying there's no role for technology, right? Of course there is. There's a big role, um, and um, you know the transition toward more renewable-based future um, with a kind of mix of different kinds of energy and and even some of the carbon dioxide removal technologies that's a big thing in the IPCC reports they assume huge amounts of like technological um, sinking of co2 out of the atmosphere um, so I think some of that is is fine um, I think we've been relying on it too much like literally um, because we're, and, and we're, and people are, again, technologically optimistic that, oh, we'll have this carbon dioxide removal technology so we can keep burning fossil fuels. But if you want to stop the problem, you actually have to cut off the supply of fossil fuels. And that it, nobody's talking about. So, like, it, there's a disconnect, right? Like, we kind of gotten oriented toward, oh, we have a technological fix in this direction, but why aren't we looking at the root? cause, right? Um, so, so that, but back to solar geoengineering, um, solar geoengineering, the physical realities of it are really dangerous, I think, because of the disparities of how it would be implemented. Um, so apparently, and this is what all the models show, they haven't actually done experimentation on this yet, but they want to. The models show that if you inject sulfate aerosols into the atmosphere, um, it has to be a continual thing, and you do it like over the whole Earth with airplanes literally flying around the Earth, um, dispersing the sulfate aeros aerosols. Um, and you can keep the temperature lower 
then, you know, you could cool the earth. The, the big risks physically are it could uh, disrupt the whole monsoon season and agriculture and water systems for billions of people, you know, um, that's one. Um, also, a big problem is if you ever started doing it and you stopped doing it, if you stopped, it would actually be abrupt, big change that is really crazy to even think about. And the other thing is there's no way to do it to ensure that everybody benefits. So there's going to be winners and losers, as there always is. Some people, some, and whoever is controlling it could probably maximize it for their region of the world um, so that other regions of the world could get totally screwed. Um, so there's no way to do it in a just way, basically. There's no, the distribution of the impacts of doing it. Yes, you could definitely cool the global average temperature of the Earth. We know that that's possible. But doing that could have all kinds of crazy distributional impacts that I think are an injustice. Um, so the climate justice arguments have been made by those advocating for more research on solar geoengineering, um, saying like, well, you know, we might need this and who's to say, you know, what's going to happen and we need the plan B or even though everyone says it's a bad idea. But um, the other thing on that I'll just mention is that none of the people who are advocating for it are advocating to do it now. They're saying like maybe sometime in the future if things get really bad, but things actually are really bad now <laughs> for some and many people are actually dying and suffering and of climate change just because those techie billionaires aren't yet like they're waiting when, when it's emergency for them, then maybe it'll be bit bad enough, you know, like who decides when it's bad enough. Um, there are all kinds of governance, but basically and we have no international governance system that to do deal with it. Um, we can't even adequately distribute the vaccine to the world, right? Like, we just are not good in international governance. So, like, if we had this, like, there's literally hard to even fathom how it would, most likely it would be a, you know, like a rogue actor or a, a Putin or a Donald Trump who would do it, you know? I don't want to give people ideas, but... <laughs> Actually, I think it's interesting also the levels of investment and disparities. I mean, obviously, degrowth was mentioned in the IPCC reports for the yeah. first time as well, but the level of investment going into exploring and experimenting with those alternative models is not the same. No. So you think who is funding and who is investing in those and look yeah. at the pattern of that distribution. Yeah. So yeah. And then you've got a question here. Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm not in academia, but I do remember uh, when I was uh, a student, um, in uh, college about 30 years ago, we were talking about, you know, the soft sciences and the humanities and the funding that went into the, the you know, the real technical hard sciences, right? And, and about that the, there was quite a bit of focus there. And, and there was that level of dismissiveness then. Um, and if you brought that, that up again about how we need to shift to to really to really make sure we're putting our resources behind, um, you know, and valuing that um, that the type of humanities and research that's that's that needs to happen um, in order to make this shift. Um, and I guess it's hard for me to remain optimistic. You've known me since I was ten, <laughs> and you're the one who went down the road of. You're presenting where we need to go, and I'm talking about what we haven't done. You know, um, so so considering all that time passing, um, would would you know? I'd like to end on a, a hopeful note mm -hmm. uh, and leave. You know, go home with that. Be your home. Um, <laughs> and you know, what what do you think? Like, how do we actually get there? How do, how does that shift where we we start respecting? The soft, and speaking of feminism, right? Like, what is soft and what is hard and what is, you know, that, that, that's, what do we really value there? So how, how do we, what, yeah. like, can we really be taken seriously? Yeah, so thank you for the question. I think this is, I mean, I often get asked a similar question about, like, how do you maintain, stay optimistic, right? Like, the, the things are, um, so I think both, like, speaks to the optimism and then also, like, how, why I am optimistic that we can change, things can change. I think big social change doesn't happen, can happen very quickly. 
Um, it does, it's, it, it, if, the, if the conditions are right. Um, and I think we saw some of that, I mean, we saw some of that during the pandemic that like things that people could never have imagined changed, did change. Um, you know, a lot of things went back to the way they were, <laughs> but, um, and there was, you know, some hope that some of those, cha some changes would be more systemic and structural after the pandemic and they haven't been. Um, but I think we are literally reaching social tipping points. Like there's in the environmental space, there's this idea of climate tipping points and ecological tipping points, which I showed some of the things that are like really out of line. Um, but I think we're, my sense is, you know, that we are actually reaching some social tipping points where some of what's happening is like actually not acceptable to most people. Like that the fossil fuel companies made more profits in 2022 than they ever have. And where while most people are really struggling, like that, that like, why are we allowing that? Why, why are we complacent and that's okay, right? Um, and I, and I do think, um, I mean, you know, I tend to always kind of see a way. <laughs> I don't know the path, but I think that um, there's there's more mainstream um, discontent and like um, than than I think we recognize. And I think the mainstream media, uh, we lose the grassroots innovation and all that's happening, and so many inspiring people and you know people. Many of us are involved in local community-based initiatives and there's so much exciting things happening, right? And, and like, it's not, um, it's not easy to see exactly how bigger change is gonna happen, but I think we have to keep talking about it and we have to keep, um, you know, pointing it out. And, and um, you know, I, I mean, I, I can't predict the future any different than everyone else, but as uh, Susan said too, we all have different perspectives. And one of the things that I recognize in, uh, over the years is that we all have different assumptions about what will never change and what's possible to change. Um, and, and I think our, we, we all make kind of a lot of our, maybe our political perspectives based on that and or um, and then this kind of optimism about what's, what, what's possible. And I think visioning and talking about a positive alternative vision is like a necessary prerequisite, right, for cha the change to happen. So I think that's why I think there's so much opportunity for us to be more optimistic about the possibility of change, even if we don't know exactly how or when. Um, but I think there's, there's, there's potential there. Like actually, and this is what, with, back to the solar geoengineering, question, it is kind of mind boggling in a sense when we realize we're spending all this time and effort and money investing in like manipulating the natural world rather than just reorganizing ourselves, right? Like we're, why can't we have that same agency about like society and, um, and like I don't think we should give up on like reorganizing ourselves and redistributing the wealth and you know, thinking about things differently. So I just, it reminded me of Anne Buttermer, a leading uh, Irish geographer, who always talked about being a despairing optimist, and I've taken that on board. So <laughs> yeah. I have to it myself. I think it captures perfectly yeah. what you're saying about the need to keep that optimism, but we can still despair. Yeah. Where we are what's going. Yeah. Time for one last question. And, uh, Thanks, Jenny, uh, for the last talk and really interesting discussion uh, as well. My, my I have two big questions that are in fact very much linked to, to the previous question uh, as well, and maybe bring it back to higher education and, and academia. So, um, one, one question is very inspired by the thought that you're probably talking to the broad audience here, right? <laughs> so, you know, I, I, no. I, you know, I don't know most people in the room, but I suspect that you're, to a large extent, reaching the conversion to a bunch of people who came along to a, a talk like this. And so the question really is how, how we, you know, yeah. as academics, reach out to, you know, our, our colleagues. Uh, and in particular, reach out to uh, and influence our, you know, our university leadership. I know James is, is here, but, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, can you think about this in terms of 
actually our agency and structure, we all see ourselves as constrained by the structures within within which we operate. And as an academic, I, I feel constrained by the academic system. But I know that the university senior management feel constrained by mm -hmm. the systems in which they operate in their states, the rankings that are governed by government policy. So how you know, how, how do we provide uh, provide the space for um, everyone within our team, including senior leadership, to kind of take those brave steps that you've been advocating? Yeah. yeah so I guess short answer is I don't know, <laughs> um, but I'm actually, uh, one of my sabbatical projects is writing a book about this, um, which I hope that university leaders, administrators will read. That's one of the targeted audiences. Um, and I think, you know, I'm also from the US context where there is such divisiveness, even about higher education, I'm not even, about higher education, the, the governor of Florida has now banned certain um, things that cannot be taught in universities, and they've taken a very, uh, apparently a very uh, progressive public university and fired people and got conservative uh, board members in, and they're going to be restricting and changing the whole thing. So, like, there's, there's a real threat and attack on higher education in the United States. And, and also, because of the financialization of it, it's so crazy expensive for everybody that a lot of people just say it's not worth it. Like, why would you go there? And what, is, what are they doing? And they're like out of touch. And like, there's a big, there's a big um, challenge that's, that's a little bit different, I think. Um, and I think, yeah, I really don't know exactly how to, but I think we have to talk about these things. Like, I think that's the, the answer, I, um, you know, try. Um, um, I actually, I did have a meeting with the provost here uh, last week and, you know, she's very engaged on, on these issues and thinking big about what's possible to change and, um, and very aware of the constraints, as you mentioned, like, right, there's a lot of constraints. Um, and that's why I think it's not just about internal what goes on in the universities. It's also external education policy, public funding for education, health. Um, you know, the, the whole framework of climate justice is that we actually need big public investments in everything, from education to health, to housing, to transportation. Um, and, 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 and that, like, is a, is a key part of, of what we need. So it's not just what happens inside the university. Um, but it's also a education policy and a public policy issue. So thank you. Great to see you.